I'm Juliana. I'm one of the Mayo PGY1 interns. Um, and the next hour is going to be talking about neurosurgical emergencies. And I actually had a slightly different plan for this presentation up until last night. Um, I took call and it was one of the busier calls that I have had. So instead of going over specific neurosurgical emergencies, I'm going to kind of walk you through what the call went through and what it was like. Um, and so the format, I would love if people would be interested um, to chime in and, um, you know, volunteer to say what they might do in the situation or highlight where I could have done things a little bit differently or a little bit better. Uh, your opportunity to Monday morning quarterback an intern night call on a busy Friday night at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, so, yeah, that sounds like an awesome plan. Um, so if people are comfortable, uh, feel free to unmute yourself uh, and turn your video on uh, if you'd like to contribute or, or if you're a little bit more shy, uh, feel free to post in the chat and uh, I'll be monitoring it and, and I'll, I'll try to uh, reflect your voice. So That would be great. Thank you so much. And I also will try to monitor the chat. Um, this is going to be completely informal. Um, just an opportunity to talk through what it's like to take call overnight, parts of it by yourself, parts of it with some backup in the hospital. So without further ado, here at Mayo, when you take the night call, you take the pagers at six o'clock. So last night at six o'clock, I was still closing a VP shunt. Um, the chief had scrubbed out, he went home, I was finishing up. And at six o'clock, of course, exactly, I get the spine and cranial on-call pagers. And on my way after closing that VP shunt, um, I got a new patient page, which just means they had someone's put in a consult. So I'm still trying to figure out how to take care of the patient. And um, in the radiology suite, they're getting their shunt series. And I start pulling up a little bit of information on this new patient and I get another new patient page. At the same time, I get a page from the emergency department asking me to call them and a page to call an outside facility. So kind of the first question is, of all of these um, couple of scenarios, what do you think the best thing to do is first? Or how would you tackle getting all of these pages pretty much at the same time when you still have a patient on the way to pack you? Any volunteers? If Hi, no, I'm that's okay. a volunteer. Um, Go for it. I think maybe getting some help. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't imagine medical students are there, but I would ask a medical student to see if um, one of these seems to be more urgent than the others. Um, and then depending on like the level of urgency, I would attend to that first. I think that's an excellent idea. Always the right thing to call for some backup um, and triage is exactly the right thing. It, um, someone asked about co-residents. At this point, I, there were a couple of co-residents around, um, but one of the very first things that I was taught by a more senior resident is to pull up the images. And the images are an excellent way to help you triage, to look at should you look at which new patient first or should you call the outside facility. So I pulled up the images on a couple of the patients. So one of the new consults is a 93-year-old woman with a T12 compression fracture. And I quickly look at one of the notes and it says she is completely intact. The next patient, uh, the 48-year-old female with questionable cauda equina, um, and the radiology report says it is an unchanged compression of the S1 nerve root. Um, and the ED thought she was neurologically stable and had positive rectal tone. Yeah, yeah. The outside facility is asking me to review a spine image no. and they give me a clinic no. number. I'm I think sure. this is, um, before we go further, I at this point hadn't realized kind of the rules about what when an outside facility calls the resident, how you can best triage that call. And so for us, that needs to go to the chief resident. That doesn't go to a junior resident. So I triage that away to the chief, looked at these two, trying to decide if I should go see one of them first. Um, but oh, I still have my patient who I need to drop off at PACU. 
So looking at these two, I decided they were stable, didn't need to rush off to yeah. see either of them. So I drop my patient off and pack you, and I get another new patient page. Um, and I'm told that there's an incoming trauma in the resuscitation bay. A 30-year-old male found down in a park, yeah, no sensation thing, below his xiphoid process, plegic in his legs. So at this point, I, I'm not sure. To me, the triage process between the three that I need to see are pretty obvious. No sensation below a xiphoid process, acute issue, um, unknown clinical history. So I went to the resuscitation bay and pushed off the other two. It's true, maybe I could have called a medical student or a co-resident to see the others. Um, but at that point, I decided they likely were stable enough to wait maybe an hour or two while I took care of this emergency. So in um, the CT scan, which was where I met the patient, this was the image that came up. So what would someone do if they had a patient who this was the image that they saw in the CT scanner? Yes, that's true. It's a spondy. Um, are we thinking, so at this point, the thought's going through my head, this is likely the cause of um, the severe neurologic yeah, deficits. Yeah, uh, yes, he, at this point, so someone asked if he needs to be in a neck brace. He had already been put in a cervical collar by the emergency department. So I immediately saw this image and called the chief because to me, I don't, I'm not at the point in my training where I know if something needs to go to an OR or it's okay to wait a little bit. Um, so I called the chief and he also told me I had another incoming trauma um, and wanted me to get a current exam and wanted me to update the imaging because at this point we only had um, head and spine imaging. So he asked for a thoraco, um, thoracic and lumbar. So the, the exam on this patient was no sensation below the xiphoid process um, and completely plegic. He is so inebriated that he's not really able to give me any history he's oriented to person and year but still pretty inebriated um ooh, someone brought up asia a um yep. yes and someone also brought up that this is a cord injury yep. so surgery more important than imaging yep. ah that brings up something that we talked about as a team the timing of whether or not someone needed to go to surgery or needs to get more imaging um, and okay. I waited a bit for the chief to come in and see this patient, and we had a conversation with the consultant who um, believed that it would be safer to wait until the morning, until after he was able to get updated MRI images to be able to take the patient um, to the OR as safely as possible. So at this point, I'm communicated with the resuscitation bay team so that they know um, that we're likely bringing this patient to our service, likely going to the OR tomorrow. Still in the works, um, coordinating to get him to an MRI. So while I was trying to send him to an MRI, I get another new patient page. Um, and there's a new trauma in the resuscitation bay, which conveniently is very close to the CT scanner. So I walked away to go meet my new 25-year-old male who had um, an unhelmeted motorcycle accident with spine injuries and intracranial blood. So that was the report I got from the ED. And while he was, uh, these are some of the images that I quickly pulled up on my phone to see the intracranial hemorrhage. Um, to be perfectly honest, I didn't have time to look at the spine images. I read that he had a C3 acute fracture. So he is an x-ray because he has multiple orthopedic injuries. And so in between each slide that they're taking for the elbow and the knee and the leg, I rush in to try and get a quick portion of the exam. Um, and so to me, this 25-year-old gentleman seems fairly intact despite um, traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, C3 fracture. At this point, he's in a cervical collar. Um, so while I'm trying to get this exam, radiology stat pages me about that 30-year-old saying that there's concern for a pica stroke. 
Um, and that there's also a right transverse foramen fracture, which is potentially causing a vertebral artery image. So at this point, conveniently, the chief comes in, so we can kind of triage between the many patients at this point that we have to see. He tells me that he's going to stay with this 30-year-old male. And also, oh, by the way, we have a new incoming trauma, probably going to arrive in about an hour, probably an operative case. Um, and at that point, I also get an ED page about a five-week old. So the chief sticks with the 30-year-old male, and I go off to get an exam on the five-weeker. Um, this is a five-week previously healthy female dropped on the head by a family member. So if you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, we have um, a skull fracture and a little bit of um, trauma exteriorly. I hadn't noticed this at the same time, but the radiology report was that there was either a subdural or um, possibly subacute intracranial hemorrhages. So as I'm looking at this baby, she's crying, she's moving everything, Fontanelle feels flat. I touch base with the PICU um, and they're willing to accept the patient. So I let them take the lead, I say, please call us if there's an acute neurologic change. But for now, the little baby looks pretty stable. So whew, now it's time to regroup a little bit. At this point, we've had multiple traumas, multiple routine consults. I go see that 93-year-old and the 48-year-old who are both neurologically intact, so we are not needing to uh, intervene acutely on them. So thankfully, I had about an hour to update some lists prepare the email team to sign out to the day team, and the chief goes home. About an hour after all that craziness happened, I got a couple pages. Jen Neuro is telling me there's a new brain met on the way in. The ED is telling me there's an incoming head bleed who's on Coumadin. And the chief informs me we have another incoming trauma. So... Here's a little bit more of a um, conversation to see, you know, in terms of triage, what would people do in the situation? So I have um, the, one of the patients that we were expected. He's a 42 year old gentleman with hemophilia. He fell about 20 feet. And these are his images on the bottom. So he's got three column fracture. I also have a 15 year old after a motor vehicle accident and they're telling me there's a T7 spinous process and T4 and T5 compression fractures. So at this point, what would people do? Would you, would you see the known trauma or go see the 15 year old? Any thoughts on how to triage the situation? So I see a couple of people talking about the 15-year-old. Um, someone's asking about stabilizing the lumbar fracture. Um, and then someone uh, brings up an excellent point, compare the imaging between the patients. And then, yes, the patient with hemophilia, um, I find out at this point that at the outside institution, the patient got several 10,000 units of the factor that they were deficient in. So from a bleeding perspective, that patient was turned over to me as stable. Um, so I ended up going to see the 15-year-old first. But again, there's no real right answers when you're deciding to triage. Um, I ended up going to see the 15-year-old, who thankfully was intact. And TCGS at this point is asking me, can we take this patient to the OR. Is this patient safe from a neurologic perspective because they have so many soft tissue injuries that they need to take the patient immediately to the OR? So I pull up the images and it's a small T7 spinous fracture. I didn't bring up the images for us to see because they um, were not significant enough for any of us to prevent uh, the trauma team from taking the patient to the OR. So there was a T4, T5 compression fracture, T7, small, small spinous process fracture. Um, and we ended up deciding to just put the patient in a brace 
Um, and then I went to go see the new patient, the 42 year old with hemophilia who fell. Um, yes, so I'll pause. Uh, Lucas Karlstrom, one of our PGY4s is on the call and I'd he typed something in the chat. I'd love to hear his thoughts on this, if he doesn't mind speaking up a moment or two. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Lucas. Um, Julian is doing a great job. Um, scenarios like this really aren't that uncommon. Sometimes you're in the OR um, and you're operating, you're just trying to look at pictures or you're getting called from the ED on multiple people, or you're getting called about someone in the ICU and some in the ED. And learning how to triage things quickly is definitely a skill set you'll learn early on in residency. Um, and, and the way I, I, I now, sort of finishing up junior residency, thinking about taking chief call next month, is what, what is the worst thing that can happen right now to this patient? Particularly when you're on call, very, very infrequently do you actually need to solve the patient's problem. Um, a lot of times it's you need to garner more information, you need to learn more about the patient's history and what else is going on. But you always, to, to keep the, the priority in your mind, what's the worst thing that can happen? Are they anticoagulated and they can and have a worse and bleed? Do they have a partial spinal cord injury that can become worse? Do they have, uh, you know, uh, evolving stroke or evolving dissection? You know, what are the things that can truly kill the patient or cause them worse neurologic harm? And what are those things happening in the setting of? Do they have other major trauma? Are they hemodynamically unstable? It'd be, you know, theoretically great to take an Asia B patient to the OR now. Um, but, you know, I had one of these cases a couple years ago. If they've got an arrow sticking through their heart, you know, that patient's not going to survive surgery. And so what is the worst thing that can happen to this patient right now? It might not be related to neurosurgery. Um, and sort of figuring out what that is and then triaging the brain or the spine appropriately will certainly help frame the, the discussions and some of the other smaller things and kind of sort themselves out when you have time. And I think another thing that um, is a little bit tricky in terms of triaging when you're thinking about what the worst things that can happen to the patient, like Lucas said, it may not always be a neurosurgical issue. So that's where communicating with the other members of the teams who will come see a trauma patient is incredibly helpful. So throughout this night, um, I, every single one of these ED traumas, I would see the trauma general okay, surgery individuals, I would see the ortho individuals, the anesthesia team, the ED team, um, and it well, just ended up being kind of a funny, we enough. kept coming together on all of these new patients and um, kind of communicating to make sure that everyone's priorities were met. So okay. for this ED patient, this was very low on my priority okay. list, but very high for the trauma general surgery team to rush to the OR. Whereas for the Let's ED uh, trauma who fell 20 feet, yeah, the yeah. trauma general surgery, from their perspective, they couldn't care less. Yeah, there was nothing in the abdomen, nothing in the lungs, nothing, any, anything else besides this um, lumbar fracture. So it's communicating to make sure that all of the patient's needs are met, not just the neurosurgical needs, um, which I haven't really been talking too much about so far because oh, at this point there are just so many pages and you're trying really hard to keep up and not lose track of any patients. Um, one of the most important things, especially on a busy call night, is to figure out what your system is so that you don't lose track of patients. Because when you're clobbered with new pages all of the time, um, you know, you might not think that you'll be the one to forget a patient, but um, you certainly don't want to be that patient. And for me, it's carrying around a piece of paper and just writing down all the clinic numbers. Other people might use a phone or make a list in their Epic. Um, whatever the system is for an individual, it's just important to figure out what that is and stick to it. So at this point, the 15-year-old has been whisked off to the trauma, um, uh, the trauma operating room. The 42-year-old male with this um, significant three-column fracture that's unstable is surprisingly intact. He doesn't even really have any scratches on him, which I found completely impressive for someone um, with hemophilia and such a high bleed risk. So since his only 
trauma issue was a neurosurgical one. We admitted him to our service, neurosurgery, and started to make plans to go to the OR this morning. So actually, at this point, he's in the OR right now. So moving on to my next slide. Okay, so at this point, we had, I want to make sure I get this right. So the 42-year-old with hemophilia going to the OR. We also had the C6, C7, 30-year-old uh, male. So at this point in the evening, um, had gone to MRI, had gotten a chance to talk to the chief and the consultant. And the decision was they wanted to have two first start ORs, one starting quite early in the morning around six and one starting maybe a little bit later around 8 a.m. And this case was supposed to go first uh, and the consultant wanted to do a C6, C7, ACDF and a posterior um, C, I wanna make sure I get the levels right, C6 to T3 fusion. So a combined uh, front back approach to stabilize this patient. Well, at that point, anesthesia lets us know that they're definitely not gonna be able to support a 6.30 start tomorrow morning. And they don't have the ability to cover two rooms because as we've gotten clobbered, so has everyone else. And at this point they have multiple ORs running and have called in their backup team. Um, and I think at this point it's maybe two in the morning, one or two in the morning, so it's late-ish, but still, you know, you still have many hours of call left. So here's another point of triage. Do you push the surgeries to the right? Is it going to make that big of a difference? Do you push them to the left? Do you go overnight? Which one do you end up going overnight? Um, these, I didn't make any of those decisions. I asked the consultant what his preferences were and what he thought was higher acuity. And he thought the front back took precedence. So I took a pause, went and listed the case called anesthesia and charge um, to make sure that everything was set up so that this patient could go in an hour and a half. And the reason it was an hour and a half was because the anesthesia team was taking care of a AAA rupture and a hostile abdomen. So that was the time that they needed to turn over with their personnel to be able to safely intubate my patient. So I also, as I'm preparing to bring the patient to the OR overnight, get another two patients. Um, one of them was an expected trauma. It was a 77 year old guy with a T11 dish fracture. And um, the consultant had said, this definitely needs to go to the OR soon. I also get a page that I have an 89 year old woman on warfarin found down after an unknown period of time. These two I am being told are being brought to the resuscitation bay as we speak. How do you decide which of these two to go see first? And who, who else do you think you could call in a situation um, like this? Or who else might you want at the bedside um, with one of these patients? Head bleed on warfarin or an unstable spine fracture? Neurology for the 89 year old. Yes, exactly. So, that's exactly right. Um, I knew that the dish fracture was um, high acuity. I needed to pay attention, needed to make sure that patient was safe. But this 89 year old who's on warfarin, that bleed could have continued bleeding the entire time the patient was being transferred from an outside ED. Um, I had been told they had been reversed, but you, that may or may not be effective. You still don't really know the functional status. So I called the neurology ED senior to um, ask them to meet me and be prepared. Um, and I also contacted the neuro critical care team, which isn't always um, what happens in a hospital. It really depends on the relationships you have with some of the other services. But the person on overnight, I knew very well. Um, and at this point, I have multiple traumas trying to prep two to go to the OR. Um, really wanted to get some backup. Trauma surgeon, yes. 
Um, someone is asking if we should consult a trauma surgeon in any and all of these cases. So the decision to consult a trauma surgeon, I think is institution dependent. The way it works here at Mayo is the, um, there's a, it's called the ATC, um, Lucas may be able to speak to this better, how different services get consulted. Um, but the, I know the emergency department manages who they call to the resuscitation bay for incoming traumas. Um, we're not always informed who else might be on the way. Um, but in, all, in many of these cases, the trauma team was already there waiting for me when I showed up to see the patients. Have you guys ever played that game, pin the tail on the donkey, where you close your eyes and just and try to put the, the tail on some structure across the room? I'm convinced that the ED structure, and I presume this is most places, is a similar uh, methodology for who they contact and when. It's sort of throwing a dart at a random target. Um, you know, I've been called as early as an hour in advance for a patient who came in who had nothing neurologic and as late as a patient who was in the OR for an exploratory laparotomy because they are hemodynamically unstable from a massive bleed in the head and a gunshot wound to the neck. Um, so it's anything and all in between and you should never assume, and, and by and large, they do a good job. They just triage a lot of complex things. Um, but uh, the rhyme and reason, and this is gonna be at almost any institution, uh, that when and how you get contacted about patients is going to be extremely variable. And you can never assume that they have or haven't done something or the things that they've said they've done have actually been done. And so it's always good just to double check and clarify. And, uh, you know, the, the phrase that gets thrown a lot in, in our surgeries, you know, trust but verify. And so I... Um, made the decision to see the 89 year old first and I met her and she was pretty intact she was very hard of hearing but that seemed to be her baseline she was mildly confused um, so I told the ED team to send her to the CT scanner to get some updated images um, and then as they were going to the scanner um, I went to go see the 77 year old male. Now, arguably someone could make, you know, in retrospect, because I was kind of thinking about how things went last night. Um, I do kind of question my choice to let the 89 year old go to the CT scanner by herself um, without um, going with her. You never know, even if someone is awake and talking, a little confused, but mostly intact, if they're gonna acutely decompensate, especially with someone who has an intracranial bleed who's on any type of blood thinner product. So she, I got lucky. Uh, she could have acutely decompensated while she was in the CT scanner and I would have been um, in a different building in the resuscitation bay and maybe not have found out until later that she needed an urgent EVD um, or higher level um, neurosurgical care. But as the saying goes, better lucky than good. I don't know um, if anyone else has some perspective or kind of their thoughts on what they would have done. Lucas, I would love to hear your perspective. If you had these two, what, what would you have done? How could I have managed the situation better? No, I think you did a great job. Um, there, there's nothing that's going to be more frustrating in your residency than people that play Monday morning quarterback or you're sitting at M&M and they're reviewing all the decisions you make um, in, in on call or over the weekend, things like that. Um, it's always easy when you're in a conference room looking at images to sit down and say what someone did wrong or how they should have done something differently. Um, but you know, it's always different when you're the one that's in the ED, you're talking with the people, you're seeing the patients, you're, you're viewing the scans, you're getting paged about patients that are in the hospital already, and so you're distracted, other things are going on. Um, you know, I think it's easy to second, second guess yourself and wonder, should I have done different, done things differently? That doesn't mean that there's not always room for improvement, but, you know, sometimes you just have to to, um, you know, except you're doing the best job you can, you're processing information and you're learning as you go forward. I think you handled everything great with these cases.
there were times when it felt very chaotic and not like it was going um, great. So I appreciate the kind words. I think there's still always lots to learn and I hope to continue doing a little bit better um, with each time I take call. So one of the um, things I, I have- uh, If you don't mind, sorry for interrupting you, Ju Juliana. There's a salient point here about um, uh, anticoagulant status. And I think this is something you'll you'll learn more about as you you see cases, um, you know, checking checking INR platelet tag, um, any and everything you can is going to be critical for just about every patient, even if they don't necessarily have a hemorrhage but they have a fracture and you might take them to surgery. You almost always want to check it on every patient. You always want to know. You always want to know what medications they're taking. Um, but it always becomes more complex. And what are you actually shooting for? Um, you know. Reducing INR, you know, in general, what you'll hear is reduce it below 1.5. That's sort of our rough estimate for all comers in neurosurgery. We like it as low as possible. Um, FFP, fresh frozen plasma, has an INR roughly of approximately 1.5. So if you're trying to bring it down, you can't use that. You need to use a real reversal. Vitamin K, either IV or oral, is going to take some time. Um, K Centra, some of the newer other NOAC reversals can get things down quicker. But you need to think about why is the patient anticoagulated? So if they have, um, you know, an LVAD or another cardiac device where if you reverse them, you know, their device is going to fail, you need to keep everything in mind. Or if they're on liver failure, maybe their labs all look good, but you know that their platelets are going to be dysfunctional. And so having a little better, under, it's good always to have the numbers and to check the platelets and check the INR and have an idea what the PT and APTT are. But you always need to synthesize that with the patient because oftentimes, particularly the ones you're going to see in trauma and the ED, they're very sick and they've got liver dysfunction or they took a bunch of aspirin that, that you don't know about or, um, you know, they've got DIC from their other injuries. So their labs might look okay and or they've got other medical comorbidities where you can't just simply reverse it or you can reverse it, but you have to have a plan. Um, you know, maybe you can reverse the, the warfarin, get the INR down, but you need to be willing to start them back on, hep on heparin if they've got, you know, a mechanical valve or something in that regard. So um, it, there's always nuance to anticoagulation, but it's something we think a lot about and should not be missed. Not only what the values are, but um, are those values that you can trust and are they going to maintain? Just getting the INR down with Kcentra for a warfarin patient means that that patient in about four to six hours is going to have another bump because the medication is going to wear off and their warfarin is going to hang on. Um, and so they're going to become anticoagulated again. So if you're going to the OR, you need to redose them. And so continuing to think about these things as you go through, not, and not just during their initial presentation, but also in surgery or overnight or throughout their hospital stay. And um, one thing that was important for this patient is she was on warfarin, warfarin for atrial fibrillation, um, which although being on long-term anticoagulation for someone who has atrial fibrillation minimizes the risk of stroke, reversing it and being off of the um, medication is safe and acceptable for a short period of time. That at our institution, at least, it may be completely different at other places, um, is a conversation that we have with the vascular medicine team on most of the patients to discuss the safe length of time that we can keep someone off whatever their anticoagulation is, um, while also balancing the risks of the stroke or um, other types of uh, diseases exacerbating because someone is off that anticoagulation for a period of time. So. The 89-year-old, when we did the repeat head CT, it looked almost identical, thankfully. Um, so I called the neurocritical care team, uh, and thankfully, they were willing to co-manage the patient for me. This is kind of a quirk about Mayo. Like I said, every institution manages patients in the neuro ICU differently. But here at Mayo, when we admit a patient to our ICU, neurosurgery can either be primary or we can co-manage with the neurocritical care doctors where we manage their neurosurgical concerns and have discussions to co-manage um, all of their other medical comorbidities. 
and I called the neurocritical care person overnight. Here's an example of calling for help when you need it. And I explained how many other traumas I still needed to see and uh, make sure they were getting the appropriate care that they needed and asked if he would be willing to accept um, the patient. And since we'd worked together up on um, our ICU when I was up there for a couple of months and we had a good rapport, I felt safe leaving her in his care for a period of time while I went to go see the 77-year-old guy um, with the dish fracture, who also surprisingly was completely intact. Um, and he expressed his gratitude for being transferred to Mayo because apparently a couple of days ago, he felt some back pain unexpectedly, talked to a medical provider, and they said something to the equivalent of, walk it off, take a couple of Tylenol, rest for a couple of days, you'll be fine. Um, and his back pain continued to get worse and worse, and so finally he went to his family medicine doctor who ordered the CT scan that sent him to the Mayo Clinic. And so I accepted that gentleman on our service, um, and I knew I still needed to list the case to send him to the OR because he was going to be third in line. So at this point we have three patients who are going to the OR, um, the front back, the um, T11 dish fracture, and that L4 three column burst fracture. So uh, before, I, before I move on, um, this is conveniently the end of all the traumas that I had for the night. I think this was maybe 3.30 or 4 a.m. So the front back was in the middle of the ACDF. I went to the OR to kind of catch up and run the list. Um, throughout the night, I had been communicating pretty closely with the chief resident who had been communicating very closely with the consultant. Um, and I think this is another example of where you can figure out how your team works best. Some of these patients, the more stable ones, we would send um, brief messages in the clinic number or an email um, because they were lower acuity issues that could be addressed later or a couple of hours later, as opposed to some of the true acute emergencies that needed immediate attention where I would always give them a phone call. Um, one of the current chiefs describes it as loading the boat um, and other people say, don't be the senior man with the secret. So if there is a incredibly concerning acute neurologic finding or a significant exam change, like someone loses a cranial nerve exam or they're acutely weak or they have significant sensation changes, that would be the appropriate time to either page or call the chief because that's not a decision that if the patient decompensates, uh, you want to be the only one who knew that there was a potentially devastating sequela of whatever brought them into your institution. So I had the opportunity for about an hour to scrub in um, and help the chief open for the posterior cervical fusion before getting paged and having to go um, AM round on all of these individuals who were still on various floors and various services as well as coordinate with all of the consulting services, make sure that the cases were listed, uh, make sure that the day team was aware, and update as many people who needed to be updating, as well as doing the normal AM rounding things like removing drains of people who had surgery and prepping discharge for people who were leaving and filling you know, requests for specific pain medications, all the typical service things that you get. Uh, paged about while you're managing all these traumas in a single night. So I think though it was an incredibly busy call um, and I learned a lot, there were lots of things that I probably could have done better. Um, I'm grateful that we had mostly good outcomes. These are of course devastating diseases, but I'm um, you know, it's always lucky when you walk out of a call day where there are so many difficult things that you see, so many patients that you have to talk to, the father of the five-week-old five, five -week -old baby and um, the daughter of the 89-year-old with the head bleed to try and communicate in less than five or ten minutes because you still have many other patients to see, 
the acuity of the situation and try and get a feel for the type of intervention they might want, the family member might want for themselves. So with that, that was my call night last night. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.